So before we start the Adda, we are just going to actually tell you all a little about the format, because this is really designed as an Adda, right? It's not a panel of presentations. So what we've done in the past is asked people, both on social media as well as people, all of you as you were coming in, to contribute a question. And we are going to pick questions and answer those. And at some point, we are going to invite people from the audience to join the adda, join the conversation, and also start answering some of the questions. So we'll signal that to you. But to start off, one of the things that we wanted to do was I got the privilege of asking the first question to all our panelists, so I'm going to do that. And my question is pretty much the title of today's discussion. What's sex got to do with it? What is this it? Why sex? Why does, what's the link? Why does it matter? So anybody, Mona, would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Parmesh, for bringing me back. And I'm delighted to be on stage with these wonderful Indian feminists. It's a huge honor for me. Um, I begin all my talks with my declaration of faith. And my declaration of faith is fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> Having said that, I'm so glad that we're beginning with this question, um, Bisha. But for me, sex is the heart of everything. I have on my right arm tattooed the ancient Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. She is the goddess of retribution and sex, and I say yes, please, to both. And the way that I describe Sekhmet is that first she will kick your head in, then she'll fuck your brains out, because that's the kind of goddess power that she has. And I think what I try to do with my work and what I insist on doing when I speak publicly at events like this is to remind people that so much, of, so much that has to do with sex happens in the dark and happens um, with, uh, under taboo circumstances and happens surrounded by so much shame. And when that happens, it means that the most vulnerable are the ones that are hurt the most. And the most vulnerable are usually girls and women or people of other sexualities. I don't like the term sexual minorities, so let's say other sexualities. So as a feminist, I insist on speaking about sex. I insist on speaking not just about the fact that I was sexually assaulted in 2011 and 12 other women were assaulted in almost the exact same way as I was, but have not been able to speak. Not because they don't have a voice, everyone has a voice, but they've been denied the ability to speak by their families and by shame and by taboo. So I speak because I can, because speech is privilege. But I also speak beyond the, the violence and the assault, and I speak about pleasure, and I speak about lust, and I speak about desire, under the format of I own my body. And this idea of I own my body is for me the heart of the sexual revolution. I own my body, it is my right to have sex whenever, with whomever, obviously with their consent, with a man, with a woman, with 10, with five, with two, but I move that conversation away from what happened to me that was painful into what continues to be a desirable and pleasurable thing for me, and so sex is at the heart of everything. Sex is the beating heart of the revolution. I mean, Mona kind of has said it all for all of us in some ways, but I think that an extension of what happens when sex is a matter of shame and taboo is that it separates us from ourselves, right? At some level, the way in which either governments or corporates in the market and families uh, legislate and govern sex and sexness inside us, it, it says that we don't know our own selves and we are ashamed of a very important part of who we are. And so it make, makes it impossible to actually go forward in life, I think. If you're not connected to that inner part of you, you can't really determine so many other things in life. And I also think that it's kind of important working around sex, I mean, in our own work, because it's a place in which we can be the most inclusive. I mean, we are all divided by our identities, whether we like it or not. We all have different sets of issues. But eventually, there are certain human experiences in which we can all come together and share and learn from each other. And I think that's why it's also a very vital kind of space in which to speak, because it brings politics down to the individual human being. It joins emotions, and it joins the body, and it joins the future and the past and the present in one place. So it allows us actually to consolidate ourselves when the world is continuously trying to fragment us. People don't talk about the necessity to eat and breathe, right? What they, I mean, they just assume that without eating and breathing, we would wither away, like our being would fail, and we'd literally die. And I'd like to put sex there with it. 
I'd actually like to make sex as important to everyday life as eating and breathing are. And partly it's, you know, and I think uh, what Mona started with, which is really important, is that so often the way in which sex is spoken about, the only way we have access to a conversation about it is through the violence that's enacted through it, through it which, is, which is about power, right? And I think I want to reclaim sex from power in that way for ourselves. But I also wanted to think about sex work. Right? Because one of the things is, sex work is given to sex workers. But I want to reclaim, and, and the, the new sort of mandate for how we live is we work on ourselves. Right? The mandate is wellness, you know, which is literally, I, I, the, the, some of the stuff I write on is about thinking about the way in which we've become our own self-generating, self-caring machines. What's left out of it is sex. So what I want us to do is reclaim sex as the best labor one can do to find oneself. You know, run, have sex, right? <laughs> but I also want to reclaim something else for sex, which is fantasy. And, you know, I, I think that often, I mean, I think that when you work on sex and you actually bring fantasy into it to actually open up the body to other ways of imagining and being, you also engage the other, which is what both these people were saying and what um, POV started with. And in, in some ways, that engaging the other allows you to release yourself into someone else. And you can do it through fantasy, you can do it through, and fantasy can also allow you that sort of extension of the body into, you know, dreams or loss, many other things. So let's spend some time, instead of checking out our Fitbits to see how many steps we've walked, <laughs> you know, let's get a sex Fitbit instead. Okay, I'm going to take a stab at, I mean, not much left to say, but just a couple of quick things that I'm going to add, which actually are from my memories more than 20 years ago before we began Point of View. One is a personal experience, which I don't often share, but uh, we, I was much younger, of course, and we had a cook working at home who got pregnant before marriage, right? And I think that is the moment when I really realized how complicated and loaded the whole question of sex is and how tied it is not just to gender, but to class, right? Because my parents, were actually fairly, re extremely liberal, to be honest. And I realized at that point, she wanted to keep the child. But her parents didn't want her to keep the child, and she was a domestic worker who came from a very poor family, right? So she didn't have the resources to make this happen for herself. And I couldn't help contrasting her situation with mine, because our ages were very similar. Mm -hmm. And thinking that one of the factors that really sort of cuts through our experience of sex in a sense, which we don't think about, is actually class. Mm -hmm. Because if it had been me, I could have kept that child. Yeah. She couldn't, right? And the second thing that I want to say, which is also, again, rooted in my past, is I think when we were in college, you know, all of us who were friends, etc., and I had a couple of female buddies, and we used to really like talk about sex in a very free manner, sort of not in a conceptual manner, but really like the excitement of having sex for the first time, right? Like this is what I did today, this is what I did yesterday, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like one of the issues is that that kind of talk, like sex has become this kind of mystical area mm -hmm. where we just don't talk about it the same way we talk about the food that we eat or the sex and money, right? Like we're always embarrassed to ask people, how much do you earn? Similarly, we're always embarrassed to ask people, like, what did you do? Yeah, yeah. Did you do? And <laughs> I don't know the answer. I don't know why. I don't know why we don't. Yeah. <laughs> but there's something about sex and money that sort of, you know, 
forces us to keep it in the private domain. Yeah. Okay, now, I know that the four of us could keep riffing off each other forever, <laughs> but in my duty as moderator part-time, I must now ask you to take the first question, Paro. So we take the question and address it yeah, to whoever is appropriate. Out, and okay. then if you want to answer it, that's fine, or if anybody, and then we just yeah. do a quick... Yeah. yeah, or we can ask somebody from the audience. Yeah, after we've done After we've done around. Yeah. Okay. How best can people in positions of privilege like white, educated, high socioeconomic status, etc., support marginalized groups? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick answer for that. Pause the box. <laughs> I have a quick answer for that. I, I have a quick answer for that because I, I don't have any time for niceness and politeness because, you know, in times of these fascist fucks like Donald Trump, <laughs> And the fascist fuck in my own country, Egypt, CC, and so many other fascist fucks in all our lives. I don't have time for niceness and politeness. This is how you can support marginalized groups. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> Seriously. And listen. And listen. Yeah. Because when I tell people, for example, I, when I speak as a Muslim woman, and I used to wear hijab for nine years, and I fought for eight years to take it off, blah, blah, all of this business. When we talk about hijab now, it's, off, it's become this entry point into a form of racism, gendered Islamophobic racism. And so I want everyone who's not a Muslim woman to sit down and shut up. People really get upset when I tell them this, especially white people. And I tell them that discomfort is your privilege being questioned. That's what that discomfort's all about. And that discomfort is good. That discomfort, whether a man feels it, or someone white feels it, or someone in a privileged position, or if I feel it, all of us must at some point or other feel discomfort. So you can't rescue anyone, you can't speak on behalf of anyone, what you can do, and this is actually a very proactive thing, even though people think that I'm telling you not to do anything. Sit down, shut up, and listen. Actually, I think this is a question about power for yeah. me, right? And so in that sense, it's no different. I'm thinking about our work, like we've worked with women in sex work who have much less power than us. We've worked in many situations, or what about a situation where you have sort of the classic how can men support women question, right? And it's the same, which is that if you're the person in power, the group in power, first of all, yes, listen to the group that has less power, let them speak for themselves, and if you want to be an ally, then you can't lead from the front. Yeah. You have to step behind, you have to let us speak for ourselves and then support. And I think the dilemma sometimes becomes that people who are allies or in positions of power then try to take over that sort of position and speak for the less powerful group, right? And it completely, it doesn't change anything. It just keeps that power equation entrenched. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, I think also, you know, assumptions, I mean, I find there's something patronizing about the assumption yeah. uh, because it means that those who are in an elite position are resolved, yeah. arrived, they have no work to do in their own lives to reformat the kind of brutalization of being elite. Uh, and also it makes believe somewhere that we have nothing to learn from each other, right? Like there can't be friendships, there can't be solidarities, and that the world will forever exist in this charity upliftment kind of model, which is, I don't think, how it really uh, works on the ground. And to give an example, it's like men will help women, as Vishaka pointed out. So the definition of what is liberated sexuality has become defined by one type of heterosexual male notion, only one type of heterosexual male notion of what is sexual liberation. So now everybody's supposed to play catch up with that notion. So I think it also, this, you know, how can the privileged help the unprivileged begins to define agendas in a way that's actually not liberating to anybody. Yeah. And I'd say, so continuing this, I'd say the first thing you need to do as a person of privilege is shut up and listen to what you assume your place of privilege looks like, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the point at which you actually understand things like the assumptions that underlie developmental discourse. It actually gets you to take account of the way in which you assume that your power gives you the right to make a decision for someone else. Because often, you are actually completely incapable of listening to yourself, and actually terrified of what you'll find. So I think, and if you don't do that, you actually can't hear what somebody else is saying, right? So, I mean, this is a standard workshop thing. Undo your own assumptions of power first. That's, you know, take responsibility for yourself and then open yourself up. 
And sometimes opening yourself up will make you angry, miserable. It'll shake up your sense of where you, your authority lies. You have to give up your authority. And I think everybody, all of us are saying that. Yeah. Do we overestimate the importance of education in creating a revolutionary zeal? How can Middle Eastern women proclaim their feminism in the face of widespread illiteracy? And I'd say that doesn't just apply to the Middle East. That's the kind of question that might have come from anywhere and exactly the sort of person who we were addressing in the last show. Do you want to start? Am I going to start? Am I yes. going to jump in? Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Um, I reject completely the notion that education is necessary for revolution because, I mean, the simplest way to um, handle that is what kind of education are you being given? Are you being an, given an education that helps you dismantle privilege, that helps you dismantle patriarchy? Or are you being given the kind of education that says Fatima cooks in the kitchen and Muhammad plays outside? That's not the kind of education that's going to liberate anyone. And it's also an incredibly patronizing assumption to think that a woman who can't read or write doesn't understand that it's her right as a human being to be equal. So it's assuming all of this kind of, again, I think what you were also saying earlier, Paro, it's assuming this kind of privilege that doesn't always lie where it's said to lie. The kind of education that we've been receiving in Egypt, for example, is incredibly poisonous propaganda that has allowed a military regime to stay in power since 1952. That is not a revolutionary weapon or tool at all. So, and also, quite honestly, I don't have the patience to wait for 18 years of formal education for someone to become a revolutionary. I don't have that time, you know? I'm done with patriarchy. If I want it to be given in breast milk, in formula, in all kinds of stuff, in the sperm that ovulates. We don't have time to wait to create. Then who's creating our curricula, you know? I mean, like, talk about pedagogy of the oppressed and all of that. If you're talking about dismantling the kind of poisonous educational system, fine, we can have the educate, that, that conversation. But if you're telling me that we're going to recreate curricula that has allowed misogyny to continue to exist in India or Egypt or the United States or Rwanda or anywhere else, that's not the kind of education that I promote. What do you think of pornography? Violent pornography, should, it, should violent pornography be censored? Favorite topic. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I, I genuinely believe this, right? Like, if we don't think sex is dirty to begin with, why do we think something that is meant to create sexual arousal? is intrinsically dirty. I can't understand that. And that is what pornography is. Whether you look at the literal like dictionary definition or whether you look at the practice of it, right? It's meant to create sexual arousal. So intrinsically, I don't think there's anything wrong with pornography. I think pornography has come down the ages in many different forms, probably from cave paintings to what we now think of as internet pornography, right? I think the issue is that there are, I think there are two issues and I think that's why people like to talk about it nowadays because this is something we hardly talked about till the internet became sort of the beast that it's become, right? And I think the issues are one is access. Basically the internet has made it possible for everybody now to get online, adult or children, and to look at sexualized images, including images that are meant to arouse, right? The second thing is, so something that was actually much more furtive, secretive, et cetera, et cetera, has suddenly come out in sort of like with a bang, right? Like in a public sort of way. Uh, I think the second thing is that we tend to think of pornography as one thing. So we tend to lump all sorts of porn, erotica, everything into one big thing. And then it's very difficult to tell what the issues are. So the way we actually did a really interesting workshop called Imagine a Feminist Internet, where we asked all the women and trans people present to do an exercise where they talked about what were the benefits of pornography and what were the harms. And what was really interesting was many of the women said that, you know, in an age 
where you can actually get porn or uh, images much more easily or, you know, of course, text, etc., and graphics, etc., that they were able to learn about many different kinds of sex from certain sites, which in the past it would have just been impossible, right? Like, where would you go? You'd have to go to some sort of shop and get some sort of video or whatever. It just seemed like very creepy and furtive and all that kind of stuff. At the same time, most of the women also said that the harms of pornography were, some of it was the same thing, right? Like that if you only learn about sex through porn, you come out with a certain impression of body types, the kind of sex women enjoy, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think part of the issue is that to deal with some of the excesses or real harms of pornography, we have to actually start talking about sex in different ways. And Paru and I were actually at the Godridge Culture Lab last month, meeting Cindy Gallup, who runs a website called Make Love Not Porn, which is very interesting because she actually puts up images of real people having sex with each other, which she calls social sex, right? And her thing is pretty much the same, that if you want to sort of deal with what is considered the actual, you know, the harms, it's not necessarily about laws all the time, etc. right? Laws can deal with some harms, laws can't deal with all harms. But some of it is to have a conversation openly about sort of sex, etc. I also think, you know, in response to that um, question about censorship, that I don't think censorship has ever worked for anything. And the only way to, re I mean, there may, be, there may be things within pornography that disturb us, that, that perpetuate violence and sexism and misogyny. And the only way to counter it is actually with other types of images of sex. One of the reasons why all sex accumulates in pornography, which is often mainstream industrialized pornography, is because we don't want to talk about it anywhere else. We don't want to have it in movies. We don't want to read accounts of it. And actually when, I mean, working on Agents of Ish for just a year and a half and going out and talking to people about their sex lives, what we see is that everybody's obviously not just having sex, but they are quite, uh, it's quite beautiful and sophisticated and rich, the way that people relate to their own sex lives, but they don't see it depicted anywhere. So actually what we have to do is counter that with the kind of sexual material that we think is beautiful and arousing and exciting and have that multiplicity, right? Yeah. And that's why I wanted us to go to fantasy, <laughs> right? To really revive, I mean, this is exactly this question, which is really revive the place of fantasy. And actually, you know, porn doesn't have to be, or sex talk doesn't have to be, you know, in between friends, I mean, sex talk can happen while you're having sex, right? So literally revive the place of fantasy. So, I mean, I think what everybody's saying is that porn has a, has a place because nothing else has taken its place, right? And, you know, I mean, and porn has a, has a lovely, very old and classical lineage in South Asia, if you want to call it that, but some of the best porn was porn written by Victorians for women. Right? So one of the things that's interesting about porn is people often assume, and your work shows something very different, so does yours, um, that it's for men. But actually a lot of Victorian porn was written for women to enjoy with other women, to read aloud. Mm. Right? So why not revive that? You know? um, I want to add something very quickly as well um, to what these wonderful women have already said. And that um, ties into the question earlier about education. For so many people, porn, as you said, Ishaka, um, is the only way that they learn about sex because we don't provide good sex education in schools. I mean, I know in the Middle East and North Africa, there is zero sex education. And in the United States, we have this ridiculous abstinence-only education that also gears you up for a lifetime of misery. So in the absence of that, you get young men and women who have zero knowledge about pleasure and desire and how to please their bodies and in religious environments or conservative environments, you're not even allowed to explore your own body, to find out what you like, to masturbate, to explore. And then you're left with the question, you know, this kind of the most toxic of questions, am I normal? Is what I want okay? And there is no one to go to to ask these questions. So of course, people of all age groups and all backgrounds will go online to find out what they can't find among friends because we can't sit and have these discussions where we say there's no such thing as normal. We have to abolish that word normal. And we have to start educating each other 
and exchanging kind of like, you know, best practices about how best to masturbate, how everyone should use a vibrator, et cetera, et cetera. But those kind of conversations are non-existent. So until we have those conversations, porn will always be there as something that, that both titillates, but also that puzzles people because they can't find any real life discussions of what quote unquote normal is. Okay, we're moving to our next round of questions and we're gonna actually ask people to come and, so Kamayani, can I invite you to come and pick the next question and read it out? And after it's read out, people from the panel will answer first, but in the true spirit of an adda, we'd like to open it up. So if anybody would like to answer it, put up your hand right away because we'll only take one person from the floor. Yeah. Money can't buy me love, is it true? <laughs> Money can't buy me love, is it true? Okay. So anybody from the um, audience who'd like to answer, put up your hands at some point. And anybody from the panel? Yeah. It depends on how you define love, actually. <laughs> so it might be able to. My whole definition of love is actually um, need-based, you know. So uh, while it may sound straight out of the movie, which I saw recently, but I used to say this to my colleagues in office, and when they saw that movie, is in Diggy or whatever with Talia, but they said, that's exactly what you say. Is, and that's the reason why you probably fall in love and fall out of love so frequently. Because if you find that person who can fulfill that need for you, you feel it's love. Because that's how we've been conditioned, we've been you know, brought up to think. And, um, and then we also feel guilty of you know, uh, loving too many people at the same time because we have too many needs. So it's really about the need because um, you know, what, through my own personal experiences, um, I, I went through a separation, I'm going through a divorce right now, and you know, obviously I was shattered because here I had a love marriage and what happened suddenly one fine day there was no love. And when I started analyzing and introspecting, I realized it's really not out of love, but maybe certain needs that I would fulfill for him is no longer there, and there's someone else who's fulfilling that need. So it isn't that bad, you know, ultimately. So it's really about that, I feel. Yes. Um, I, I, I want to answer this very quickly in, in like two parts. The first part, I think only someone who has enough money can ask a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I think <laughs> that's a very privileged question, okay? <laughs> Having said that, I, I would like to address what you said about need because I am not monogamous. And I have loved more than one person at one time, and I have sex with many people. I have a primary partner, but we have an, an agreement where we're both honest and respectful to each other about this. And I don't think it's about being greedy or needing too much. I think it's about being honest. And it's, I think it's about um, being honest uh, about the kind of person that you are and the kind of um, relationships, plural, that you want. And it doesn't work. I mean, monogamy works for some people, and it doesn't work for others. And I would never, ever say you must be polyamorous because I am, and I would also never say that you are greedy and too needy because you love more than one person, because I think that's what part of our nature is, to allow ourselves to be all the things that we want to be and find the person and people, in the plural, who accept us for what we are. Can I add one line? Yeah. You know, I mean, as the resident uh, romantic on the panel, I also, <laughs> I sometimes wonder about, you know, there's always this kind of our need to define love as being not that mis mystical and beautiful. It's just a need, and, but maybe it's also just an amazing pleasure of sometimes meeting people whom we just like so much that we fall in love with them, and, or they with us. So I feel like it is also, it's just, we, we don't also have to box it up so much. It's painful when it goes away, sometimes it's not at the same time, and sometimes it's not. Uh, but I think even when you look retrospectively, if we don't follow the linear definition of love as a relationship that is now going to result in marriage and last forever, which is a construct, that's the construct. I don't think love is necessarily a construct, but loves, loves are different kinds. So if they didn't last, that doesn't mean they weren't love, is what I'm trying to say, actually. Yeah. yeah. Actually. Can I add one thing? We are a, a country, and, and I mean, at, in South Asia, right? And this includes the Middle East, that specializes in Vipralamba, in Jedi, right? We are brilliant at the aesthetics of loss, right? So it'd be interesting <laughs> to think, I mean, that's what part of our love is, right? When we're not getting, hanging, you know, like weep. I mean, we, we do weeping like no one else. <laughs> So I think 
you know, why not reclaim that for <laughs> the lexicon of love? Yeah. Religion, family, state, school. What is it about female sexuality that threatens the ideologies fostered by these institutions given their undying obsession with controlling women? I think the, the reason that the school and the state and the mosque and the temple and the family and, and all of these and the media control women's sexuality is because women's sexuality is considered a dangerous thing when left uncontrolled. And so all religions, all of them, are obsessed with our vaginas. And I travel the world basically saying, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. This is something I truly believe. But I also think that this idea that we have to remain virgins and we have hymens, all these ridiculous notions. And these are ridiculous notions that I call ridiculous because I believed them for a very long time. I mean, I, I, I also speak very honestly about how I waited until I was 29 to have what we call penis to vagina sex because I believed all these ridiculous notions of how I have to wait till I get married because my sexuality is precious and all this other stuff. And finally, when I said, fuck this shit, I'm not waiting anymore, I realized how beautiful and wonderful sex is, but not because I was in love with the person I had sex with, but because I have the right to pleasure. And this idea, this, this, this notion, when a woman actually says, I have the right to pleasure and I own my body, that is a revolutionary notion. That all of those things, the media, the mosque, the temple, your family's religion, they don't want you to get to that point. Because when I say that, and when I talk about how I want to destroy the notions of virginity and hymens, what is left to control women and shame them with? When I say that, yes, I have this vagina and womb and I can give life, but I've chosen to be child-free by choice. What does it mean to be child-free by choice? Not every woman wants to give life. I give life in other ways. So I think that we have to move away from this notion that there is one particular way to be a woman, there is one particular way to be sexual, and there is one particular way to obey all of these institutions that are obsessed with our vaginas. Enough obsession with my genitals. <laughs> I'm just going to add a small... One word to yeah, please. One word to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. You said it, yeah. But you know, and I want to actually build on what you're saying, hypocrisy to answer the same question. One of the real ideas that's used to control women's sexuality by all these institutions that are named is, again, the division of women into good and bad. So if you're a teenager, right, and you're a studious teenager, a girl, not a boy, of course, but a girl, then you're a good girl. If you're, like, interested in boys, you're a bad girl, right? If you get married, if you have sex before marriage, you're bad. If you have, within marriage, to have a child, better, best, yeah. <laughs> within marriage, to have pleasure, acceptable, yeah. So you see how these kinds of things are continuously being used, this good, bad thing to really control women's sexuality. Hello. Hi. Um, I think what has happened with the sexuality bit is also we've sort of linked it in some way with, with the honor of women. and. I, I, nobody's honor belongs in the vagina of the daughter or of the wife or it's it's a separate issue and this in south i think this in asia especially is like sort of almost synonymous with each other um and we see it a lot in our country where there are honor killings because you know there's been an affair or something as simple so i think honor is the problem we've linked it at several levels with the vagina for some reason that very fragile membrane, the hymen. I mean, how fragile is honor if it's, if it's on there, right? It's fucking non-existent. <laughs> and in fact, you don't have to have sex to get rid of it. <laughs> you can do it very easily. But I want to think, to go back very quickly to honor, which is, it's not, it, women become the way in which the honor of everything else is negotiated, in which the moral order is negotiated. And there's a whole uh, politics and economics behind it. And so that's why it's so hard to dislodge, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff holding it up. I, I think as well, very quickly, I think there's also something to be said about reclaiming the word and the concept slut. Yes. Because Absolutely. over the past few months, one of the things the Egyptian regime has used against me is they call me now a quote-unquote sex activist. And that is code word for slut, because they don't know what to do with me. And I say, you know what? I am a slut. <laughs> and then? 
And once you take that away, I mean, I'm not saying everyone here has to call themselves a slut. It's on you to call yourself whatever you want. But having waited until I was 29, I have fucked the guilt out of my system. So I am a proud <laughs> slut, okay? And so having said that, when I now walk through the world and say I'm a proud slut, what then are you going to throw at me? What kind of honor bullshit are you then going to throw at me? So it's got to be something else, right? So we've got to shift the terms of negotiations and shift the pejoratives that are used against women. Sorry, this isn't a question. This is more a stab at the question that you pulled out of the bowl. And I thought that the question really had to do with the idea of pleasure and power. And so I'm half Catholic, and I grew up with a lot of Catholic guilt. And I realized how much of that guilt wasn't just tied to sexuality, but with any kind of pleasure. And I think that's one of the ways in which we, the privileged, cont I mean, I'm, I'm saying in this country, within the intersectionalities of power and privilege, I'm more privileged than underprivileged. And I think that we control people's ability to feel pleasure, their power to feel pleasure, because that is the way in which those that our, are in power can stay in power. So it, yes, a lot of it is about sex, and a lot of it is about the pleasure derived from sex. But when you're talking about power structures, it could be any kind of pleasure. You know, we're curbing a lot of people's right to enjoy any kind of pleasure because that is what keeps those that are in power in power. I, I really agree with this because yeah, I yeah. think like f enjoying food too much yeah, or... Absolutely. But I think it's because when you know what you like, mm -hmm. then you will speak out against what you don't like. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's really that simple because I feel whatever we have in the world, we have with our senses, right? Our senses help us yeah. to make sense of the world in a way. Yeah. And so when we live by the senses, we will not live by the edicts of whatever. So it's true. Uh, I just wanted to say one. You said it was ridiculous for uh, a woman to feel that she should be a virgin till she gets married. But I don't think it's uh, ridiculous. But I think to um, have that, like you should be respective of your own opinion, but you shouldn't have it on someone else. And that's ridiculous to expect everyone to think that your opinion is the correct opinion. But I just have one question as well. Um, like. Growing up in India, I felt like, yes, uh, the idea of sex is not um, talked about enough. But then when I, went, oh, when I went to England to study, it was just like a bit too much everywhere. So in our uh, dining hall, on the tables, there was like the men's private parts scribbled. Like it was just everywhere. Like in our books, the kids would just um, draw it on your book for fun. And every picture was like some sort of vulgar pose. So how do we keep a, a balance between like not talking about it at all, like in India and abroad, where it's almost obsessive? Response. Complete respect to you. I completely get where you're coming from. But I do think that there are so many more voices telling us to wait until we are married, telling us not to have any fun with sex. There's so many of them that, honestly, we've been at this point. I know you may have had a little bit too much in your university, but where did you go to school? Let us know. Uh, I think <laughs> we'll all go. Exactly. But I, I think that you, you'll be surprised to know that the percentage of people speaking out and saying it's ridiculous to wait are so small compared to the number of people who are telling us to wait. So, no, no, we should keep saying it. Yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with that. No, but I, I do think, I mean, it's also, it's, it's a personal determination. If, she, if somebody wishes to, I mean, what we all are fighting for is everybody's right to decide what is their sexual life, not prescribe. I mean, Mona is saying that she doesn't yeah. think Everybody has to be polyamorous, mm -hmm. and if you are monogamous and you are deeply committed to that, that's something you should be able to more. define, yeah. not because somebody else told you, but yeah. because that's something you really desire. I mean, that's different, right? But, but also because as someone who waited until yeah. she was 29 mm -hmm. to do this, I think it's fully my right to say it's ridiculous. It's on you to decide whenever and whenever and however, but I remember all the pressure that I was put under, and there was no one out there telling me it's ridiculous. And I keep meeting, you know, and the reason that I say it's ridiculous as well is I think that it is honestly a crime that women are not allowed to enjoy their bodies until they, they, fall, they fall under these definitions of what is acceptable. I meet women who are 38 years old and have never been sexually intimate with someone. That is a crime. So, you know, if it were up to me, I would honestly institute lose your virginity day around the world because there's so much pressure. Now, you don't have to, you don't have to lose your virginity until you get married. I understand. God knows I waited long enough. But I think that I have earned the right to say it's ridiculous because God knows how long I waited. Okay.
this is a very specific question, right? Uh, how and when do we start discussing the third gender as school teachers? Yeah. Uh, my quick answer to that is uh, that if we, I think it depends on how we see the world. So for instance, if we really see gender as a spectrum, where there are men, women, various people locating themselves on various parts of the spectrum, I think as a teacher, I would probably ask myself, is there any real danger in introducing this uh, idea early on? Can it cause any harm? And I don't think it can cause any harm. So I would say in that sense that it's not so much a question to be put in at a certain age, like age-appropriate sex education. It's not an idea that can cause harm. In fact, it's an idea that can really like let a million flowers bloom in the mind, open up the mind, right? So I'd say as soon as possible. Yeah. And can I respond to that? Because actually we teach people, we teach very, 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 very young kids from the day they're born about male and female, right? Nobody says that's going to cause harm, right? <laughs> and actually that's a problem because you don't know if you're intersexed. In fact, for a lot of intersexual kids, the damage d done to them was that they had to literally discover themselves sometimes in parental archives after the fact. This is in the US. This is a whole intersexual movement. So if, OK, if you're willing to not teach your child that they're a girl or a boy, then don't start teaching them about all the other, you know, Aravani, Kinnara, I mean, all that other stuff at the same time. If you want to teach them that they're a girl and a boy, do all of it or do nothing. Do you have any advice for writers and reporters who cover sex abuse, especially writers who have experienced abuse personally? What would you say to them? And I'm guessing the person who, who sent this question knows that I was sexually assaulted and I've been very open about my sexual assault. Um, my answer to that, and I'm sure the panelists will have their own contributions as well, is to be mindful of whatever trauma you still have not gone through. Because I know, because I, I've spoken about what happened to me as if it happened to someone else. And this is very common um, for traumatized, for, because of traumatizing experiences where you kind of put it at arm's length as a way of, as a coping mechanism. So I know that I speak, I often speak very mechanically about what happened to me. I speak as if it happened to someone else. But I also know that I can do that because, again, because of privilege. And I think it's important when we talk about abuse and assault and any kind of traumatizing experience, it's important to remember where we stand uh, versus where others who don't have the privilege we have stand. For example, I got really good medical care because my arms were broken when I was sexually assaulted as well. I, I, I had you know, a loving group of friends and family around me to take care of me. I was believed, you know, all kinds of stuff. And many people don't have any of those. So I think it's important to recognize both the trauma and the privilege and also to recognize when you just should not speak about it anymore because it's too painful. And it's, it's often a very difficult balancing act of all three. But at the end of the day, the, the, the balance or the, the equation that I've chosen to kind of, or squaring the circle or whatever you call it, is, as I said earlier, knowing that at least 12 other women were sexually assaulted in exactly the same way I was by Egyptian riot police, but none of them have been able to speak because they've been prevented by their families from speaking. And you'll all remember that famous image out of Tahrir Square with that woman who was dragged and stripped down to her blue bra. She's still called Blue Bra Girl. Why? Because her family will not let her speak. That woman deserves a name. And so until that woman gets her name, until that woman is able to speak for herself, and until all those other women feel that the trauma and taboo and shame, and all of this actually is connected to virginity, which is why I insist on calling virginity ridiculous, because why is it so taboo and shameful to be sexually assaulted unless we're, what's in between our legs is considered so fucking precious? It is not precious, it's just a body part. So until all those women can speak and we can hear them loudly, I speak only for me, but in recognition of both my trauma and my privilege. Actually, um, one of the things, you know, it's, it's very interesting, I actually, um, this is something I've learned to do over time, is actually talk and write about um, sexual violence, right? And partly, I think, it's, and one of the things that happens a lot, and this is what Mona's talking about, is you get, like, literally a flashback. 
and you disappear, you literally disappear. So one of the things, if you, if you are somebody who's been you know, subjected to any kind of sexual violence and you're writing about it, is to really attend to your own care uh, because you might actually disappear in the act of writing. I mean, it is, you know, and people who talk about it, it is a privilege. I mean, you, it, it's not just a privilege in, in terms of uh, care, authority, power. It's also a privilege in relation to yourself because you have to be sorted enough so that you can do it in a way that you don't re-traumatize yourself as you're doing it. So I would say, you know, it's, and it's really up to you. I mean, I think you, if you feel that actually talking about it helps you do some of the work of releasing the shame that, you oft, that is often attended by something happening to you, which stops you from talking. I mean, some of it is about violence, but some of it's about shame. I mean, we talk about soldiers who lost an arm, and soldiers are allowed to uh, talk about losing an arm. But women aren't allowed to talk about how they've been molested, raped, brutalized, right? And I mean, that, that's an internalization that's social and political. So I would say you have to take care of yourself. So about uh, writing about uh, sexual assault and abuse, what I often find when I read about it is that it's almost voyeuristic sometimes. And uh, very often the human rights issues underpinning it are not addressed really well. So as a reader, I know that I would like more readers to see that addressed rather than how events unfolded, what went from where, how much intrusion was done, but actually saying things like, but this man appeared as a savior at this time and said he would drop her home and this is where the problem lies. So for example, sociologically, you know. So I think that when people are writing about sexual assault, and this is for people who have not experienced it, like just reporting on sexual assault, one of the things that always seems to happen is that it becomes a morality tale actually. Right. It always becomes a story about how you should not as a woman be going out. Such terrible things happen to you. So I do think it's incumbent on people who are writing because now what you find is that the only feminist issue that ever gets written about in the paper is sexual violence. Right. Because you don't have to talk about anything else now yeah. to show how much you care about women. Yeah. You'll tell these tales of sexual violence and talk about rape all the time and that will be your like little badge of wow I'm so reconstituted as a guy yeah. or as a reporter or whatever it is, yeah. right? So I'm always very careful of people who talk a lot about sexual violence. And I think that it has, it's always being told to you as a very gory tale of the bad things that happen to women. And in fact, the impact I feel is whenever I talk to other, uh, to young women now, they're like, we're scared to go out on our own after 11 or 12. So I think that's the way that the reporting has to shift and people have to talk back to it a bit. Yeah. And maybe just to add to that, one of the things, again, picking up from what Mona said, is, uh, you know, we sometimes do these digital storytelling workshops where people talk about their own experiences, personal experiences, right? And they make these three, four minute little videos and they record their voices. Often when you hear a personal narrative of someone who has encountered sexual assault, it's very, very different. What that person considers important right. is very different from what the reporter or the other person considers important. So maybe they need to look at some of these yeah. to actually shape up, like round out the thing a little more. Yeah. There's a comment here. Yeah. You know, so as a therapist who works around a lot of trauma, I, so I am a big fan of writing. I write myself. And with a lot of people who have undergone trauma, sometimes writing is sublimation. It helps you sublimate what you have gone through. But I think coming back to it, when you start over-identifying with what you're seeing, I think that's the tricky bit. So if there's a flashback or if it triggers post-traumatic stress for you. So I think there's a big difference between empathy and over-identification. So I think that's the line. And coming back to what Geeta said, I think our mindfulness about our self-care narrative and knowing whether I'm reporting to fight against what happened to me or to someone else. So I think that's the distinction that one mindfully needs to make at any given point. Yeah. I, I think all these narratives that we heard, even today, have one, one stereotypical image of sexual abuse right. and doesn't transcend that. And to say a lot of abuse that happens at home, 
and it happens over a long period period yeah, and absolutely. it happens under the guise of caring and loving etc and then suddenly a 12 year old is pregnant or a 14 year old is pregnant and she doesn't even know what has happened to her body absolutely. now that kind of abuse in fact uh, is never spoken about because we really report about very stereotypical things happening you know it's across class there's some bad guy coming to you and doing these horrible things to you but it is under under the accepted norm of love and care that happens absolutely. most of the time in most of our homes and we yeah. just do not acknowledge it absolutely absolutely and i think i think focusing on the outside in fact in the obsessive focus of the outside has actually let the home become sacrosanct again right and i think that's part of the project the political project actually the focusing on the outside is doing without us as feminists acknowledging that work and i'm glad you brought it up slavia yeah. geeta inter intersectionality is at the heart of your work which straddles gender study sexuality history commerce post colonialism etc in your opinion are academic disciplines opening themselves up to feminist discourse which ones and which ones are the most resistant to it i think i mean um almost i mean what's interesting is and several of my students are here one of the really i think the most resistant uh in the us disciplines if i want to call them that to actually dealing with intersectionality in a radical way is women's studies and so ironically the place that I, and i was involved as a young un undergrad at wellesley with you know building a feminist and women's studies um department and courses and i was a science student hardcore down the line and i've actually worked with hospitals to redo the idea of the perfect body right now ironically i mean the medical schools that i've worked with there's a, there's been resistance but they're also willing to think a little bit women's studies is the hardest most recalcitrant area partly because the danger lies I and mean, this is why I keep on saying we got to work on ourselves the danger lies most deeply when you think you have it right and so i think that unless you're willing to look at what you who think you have it right where you're wrong you're in, you you fucked i mean to put it succinctly I mean it, it's interesting that the I was talking to uh somebody who was asking me this question and my first chapter in my book is about my own failure to remember sexuality right and I'm a queer woman and it's the places where I forgot and retranslated myself into a subject that literally was not what I grew up as that that's where my work had to begin So all departments have this issue. So it's across the board, right? But the most dangerous one, dangerous ones are departments of women's studies. Okay. Your project, Agents of Agents of Ishk, is bilingual, which makes it more accessible. What are some other ways in which we can ensure our dialogue is accessible? Oh, yo, I feel very scared, uh, like an exam question, right? Isn't it? <laughs> I was scared. Um, I mean I think that there are there are many ways you know I mean it's by by lingu I mean it's, it's online so already we are saying that maybe not everybody is able to access something like agents of ishko other projects like that so I think that there are, I'm going to answer this as an artist actually I feel that uh, too many dogmas of form are really dangerous you know so now the latest dogma is that if it's the internet it will liberate us automatically in the 1990s it was like if you give everybody a video camera it will liberate them automatically <laughs> before that i don't know what if you if everybody has literacy they will be automatically liberated so the thing is these technologies which are supposed to be inherently liberating that's a bit a bit misleading so i feel that like on agents of ishq we work with an online and offline relationship and those online offline relationships are about people who are doing work not technologies right so i do think that the internet allows so many different types of people to come in and now it's not just that we are going to go from english to hindi but we're also beginning to get work that is directly written in hindi or kannada and that will be interesting for us because different voices will enter not just the same voice entering different spaces right but i also think it's quite interesting for us to make things accessible by maybe making books by as artists going into other forms mm -hmm. i mean the other day somebody said to us why don't you write a script for a nukkar natak and the first thing i did was wrinkle my nose but the second thing i did was 
Well, maybe. So I think actually the way to make things accessible is to be extremely promiscuous with form yeah. and continuously go back and forth. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, like people, it's very fashionable to say that, oh, India is so backward and we don't talk about sex. But then we have like awesome ancient Indian poetry, which is very sexy. We just need to re reconfigure it so we understand yeah. it's connected to our lives. Yeah. Uh, we have like amazingly erotic Hindi film songs. So I just feel like this kind of orthodoxy of form is the thing that prevents access. And we should work in many, many forms. And of course, collaborate across spaces and all of that, yes. So all of us should turn into Helen. Everybody <laughs> should. Boy or girl. Yeah. Or Ranjit, <laughs> or you know, whatever. <laughs> Whichever one you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> there are exactly. lots of nice, oh, Mona darling. There are lots of nice paintings on Agents of Wish for you to go and model yourself on, actually. And we have a comment. I think there's something that you do really well on your side, Parameda, also, which for me connects to access. And I think it's about being really conscious of voice. Yeah. Uh, so much uh, right. history okay. of sharing any kind of knowledge tends to come from a power dynamic, right? That tends to be like, I have knowledge, and now I'm bestowing it on you. Yeah. And what is really nice about the articles on Agents of Wish called the videos or whatever it is, is uh, there's a sort of an equality of speaking. And, and even though it's in the internet and you don't see the person, what you do sense is somebody talking to somebody else. So there's a sense of audience. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, in addition to form, when you actually talk one to one with people, then you're actually really creating access because you're sharing in a way that knowledge sharing like this doesn't allow, I think. Thank you. And I think in that sense also, you know, when we were planning how to make the project, it's also that idea that the emotional world of people never gets actually shared. Right. And the emotions are a very big point of common access for all of us in some senses. So it's also like something that we try to have. Can I add something really quickly? I'm so glad you mentioned ancient Indian poetry because yes. it reminds me of ancient Arabic poetry. Yes, yes. Because yeah. it, it, yeah. Right, it's so much. Camel. I mean, so many. Yeah. So our cultures have so much in common. I mean, you know, you have the Kama Sutra. We have something called the Perfume Garden. Yeah. The Perfume Garden is a book of erotica written by Sheikh Muhammad Nafzawi in, I, I don't know, the ninth century or something. Yeah. And it begins yeah. by saying, praise be to God for the cock and the cunt. Mm -hmm. And then it lists all these different <laughs> positions. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's not a feminist manual of, by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> it was written by a man in the, you know, the eighth or the ninth century. But the fact that it exists and the poetry of Abu Nawas exists. Abu Nawas was a gay queer man back in, again, 7th, 8th century Arabia, who wrote poetry you know, for the love of boys and men. And this is completely erased in our education now. And one book that's been especially inspirational for me when I was writing my own book, and which I often carry with me and read on stage when I, when I do my own presentations, is this great book called Classical Poems by Arab Women. Mm. That again, poetry that is not taught anywhere in the Arabic-speaking world. And, and these are women poets from pre-Islamic Arabia all the way through, so pre-Islamic, the um, uh, Umayyad Empire, the Abbasid Empire, and the Andalusian Empire. So from the 6th century all the way through the 12th century. And these are women who boldly celebrate desire and lust, who say openly, you know, come and fuck me three times until the, to the rings on my toes are thrown off my body. And you're reading this, you're going, oh my God, you know? This is like Tinder in the 7th century or something. So this exists in our culture. And I'm often accused when I talk about sex that I'm imitating the West. I don't need to imitate the West. You don't need to imitate anyone. It's in our culture, but it's been erased by this growing conservatism that pretends that we're puritanical, that pretends we don't want to talk about sex, and that ignores this rich heritage that belongs to me and, and all of us. When and why and how did the word fuck become a bad word? When did it become abusive? Uh, and why? When did the word fuck become bad? Bad. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when did it become abusive? When did fuck the word become abusive? Why? Oxfording, OED, Oxford English Dictionary. I don't know the history, okay, but they usually have a little timeline that tells you different uses. Yeah. For those of you, OED is brilliant. Okay, the, the old-fashioned big fat like manual, and literally tells you the different uses. So I have a feeling for Chaucer, fuck was not a bad word. <laughs> And actually, I want to add to that and say, I think it also still depends on how you use it and who uses it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, sometimes we just say, like, fuck, man. Yeah. yeah. That, so it's used in so many different ways. It's yeah. like, I think it you has can uh, reclaim it yeah. in, like, a million different ways and use it for what Hasn't you want. Hasn't it lost its badness? So, like, yeah. the other day I was in an Uber pool 
and a young woman in the uh, Uber with me was talking to her mom. And she said, Mom, that fucking thing. And I'm like, <gasps> so I think I thought it was more bad than her mom or she thought, right? <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, how do you talk to parents about sex education? Um, I have uh, never been educated in, by my parents about this. And like everybody, we've just come to know about things as we're growing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, they say things like, you know, we care about your safety and like, you know, they tell you don't go out and they don't give you pepper spray, you know, they, they do such things and then they say, they tell you uh, that if we have to talk to you about this, then where is the limit? Is anything okay? Yeah. You know, how, uh, how, do you, how do you ask them to shed their uh, baggage of this culture that they are carrying? And uh, I'm 29 now and it's really difficult. <laughs> 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 so on Agents of Ishq, there's a really great essay. It's called, thank you, it's called Amma, It's Time We Had the Talk. And it's actually the account of a young woman, because you know, Indians live at home till they don't, till they don't get married or like few people move out. And then she said, I felt hypocritical because I was sexually active, but I'm pretending to my mom that I'm not. So she has some, she did a novel thing, which she began to give her mom books which had sex in them or were about sex in some way, and they began discussing those books. So it's not like she's telling her mom everything, but at least it became an area of discussion. So maybe that kind of stuff would help you. And also, there are some sex educators, and we also have a resource list on our site of those who actually do sex ed classes for parents. So, yeah. Because parents didn't get sex ed, so they need the sex ed, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll buy I mean, them a sex ed coupon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I think, I mean, the question is, if, if the dad reads a book, right? And you're right, moms, I mean, I, I gave my mother a whole bunch of books. And she perused them and then wanted to watch movies and then wanted to come to my classes and read all my reading. And so, actually, she educated herself, which is very convenient. So I didn't have to do it. But then it allowed us to have a, diff a completely different kind of conversation Dads, so dads in the audience, you're going to have to speak up and tell us what we need to do to you <laughs> in order to make it possible for girls and boys to live with you. You know, w when I was nine, I, came, I went home to my parents because at the time we lived in London. I was born in Egypt, but we moved to London for my parents' studies because one of the kids at school, it, uh, I told one of the kids at school that babies come out of a mother's belly button or something. I was nine. And this kid was like, that's a lie. My dad is a doctor and they come out from down there. So I went back home and I told my mother, my God, they come out from down there. Is that true? And so she got one of those sex education books and she sat me down and my brother at the time was five and he was crying outside the door so she let him in. So I was nine and my brother was five and we got kind of like the basics. And I was like, oh my God, you and daddy did that? That kind of stuff. But you know, that was just the basic stuff, but we didn't really have any serious conversations about sex. Obviously, I waited until I was 29 and that was not discussed. My parents knew, but we did not, you know, like don't ask, don't tell. But, but the interesting thing that's happened since is that, you know, since the revolution began, and I began to write more and more about this, you know, my mom at first would say, so we'd have male cousins come and have dinner at home with us, and my sister and I would do this stereo kind of like, on both sides of the boys especially, and give them feminism. And my mom would be like, you're always talking about sex, you're always talking about sex, don't you talk about anything else? But then, when an Egyptian newspaper published its list of 12 most controversial Egyptians, and I was, I don't know, number five or something, it was because Mona Al-Tahawi promotes the sexual revolution. My mother sent it to me. So I was like, wow, okay. And then when my book came out, I was very wary about giving it to my parents because I wrote the sex chapter on their dining table. And I was sitting there going, oh my God, <laughs> my parents read this chapter six, don't read chapter six. So at first I was like, I, am I gonna give them a copy of this book? And, and I thought I had to because it's out there in the world. So I told my parents, look, this is my book. You don't have to read it. Please don't stop talking to me. If you get to a difficult part, just put it down and just walk away. <laughs> And my mom was like, oh my God, I have to read every single word and see what my crazy daughter has said. The title, the title alone. And then my dad said, you know, we might not agree, but we love you and we're very proud of you. And, you know, we don't have to agree on everything, but we're proud of what you've achieved. So this is just by way of saying that these are really difficult conversations. For our, and I think one of the, the reasons that I've reached this kind of peaceful impasse with my parents 
is that I realize they do come from a very different Egypt than the one that I live in now. That this is the way they were raised to raise me. And in a way, we're raising our parents in, in a new way, you know? And, I, and the, whenever I, I hear young women say, you know, my dad uh, imposes this curfew on me because he loves me and he's protecting me, I always ask them, well, ask your dad, who is he protecting you from? Right. And he's protecting you from other boys and men. And so my solution to that, other than re-educating our parents, is to impose a curfew on boys and men. Yeah. And I say this everywhere I go. Yeah. One day a month, after 7 p.m., no boys and men are outside, allowed outside of the house. And watch the dynamic of the street change. Can I just one sec? I'm just going to add to the same question. A couple of stories as well. You know, uh, one is, it's true. I think, you know, for example, I'll give you my, uh, this. I live with my partner. He's a man. We are not married. It's, my mother accepts it. But it's not like we sat down and had a deep chat, right? Somehow in some sort of weird, unspoken way, it got accepted. But I had much the same experience as Mona. I made a film about the lives of three sex workers. And when we were having the launch event, I invited my mother. But then I was completely like, freaking out is the only <laughs> word. Because I was like, oh my god, there are condoms in the film. What is my mother going to say? I didn't give a damn if the rest of the audience liked, hated, whatever the film. I was only worried about my mother. Good thing was in the last scene of the film, I'm in the film and I'm dancing with the women. My mother was only concerned about whether I looked good dancing or not. <laughs> so the moment passed. Yeah, I'm just going to speak as a father. And I have a son, unfortunately. I don't have a daughter. And at a certain age, I gave him a book, which disappeared. But he obviously read it. And uh, I told him, you know, have you kind of read that book? Yeah, Dad. But I knew where he'd hidden it, but I didn't say anything. And then slowly over the years, even now, he's a doctor and all the rest of it. He'll ask me. And then he said, don't tell Mom. <laughs> but, you know, we kind of opened the gate saying that, yeah, it's cool to talk about it and all the rest of it. Um, just coming back to the education bit, so um, we were talking about how some of the literature is kind of um, pushed under the carpet, but the literature or whatever, the, the education that some people are getting, if you've uh, you know, read the news recently, is that ugly uh, you know, fathers and mothers of ugly daughters have to pay a dowry and others don't. That, that's in our syllabus, in a book, in an educational book. So um, that's the access kids have, that's what they're being taught, that if you're ugly, you, you know, your parents are going to have to pay a dowry. Um, it's a really, really interesting talk. Uh, I just wanted to talk about what you had said um, about girls going out like post 11 or something, like reclaiming public spaces, reclaiming especially the nighttime. Um, just a question about that. Um, I understand all of this is based in a very like protectionist discourse and not on a, you're not looking at freedoms, you're not looking at rights. But how do you sort of practically, when someone says, um, that girls should, you know, um, defend themselves in the moment, whether it's by taking self-defense classes or wearing appropriate clothing. What is appropriate is a whole other thing. But versus, again, victim blaming and slut shaming the person and saying that, oh, you know, you, you can go out, but you have to, like, are you really going to wear that? And then if you do wear that, that's the problem. Like, how, what is the line? Because you have to, because there is something that you should protect yourself, but then aren't you kind of victim blaming? How do you deal with the kind of opposite? ideas. I just want to respond uh, in a very different way and go back to what Flavia said. I think one of the things, I think that actually you have to actually change the terms of what, what's being said in a very different way. The most, the, the bulk of sexual violence and assaults are at home. Now you don't tell people not to go home. In fact, in this narrative that you are talking about and that most women face, you're asked not to leave the home, right? Home is infinitely more dangerous a lot of times than the street, right? And so, I mean, it'd be interesting to ask, and I think the street is being constituted as more dangerous as a way, I mean, home and work, 
right? Literally, the, the different forms of the domestic are your place of danger. And you figure out ways to deal with it in really complicated ways, often by not talking. So I'd like us to, I mean, if we're going to stick on the question of violence, actually like us to ask, I mean, ask for a public change in, I mean, I'm not saying don't deal with the question of being able to walk on the street as and how you will. Lo you know, why loiter? Loiter, lounge, amble, do nothing, sit, whatever. And I think, I mean, I think that partly women are being, you know, this goes back to the Why Loiter Project, you're being forced to move and you're being sent home. And it sort of makes home a safe, a, a safe place where it's not, right? So, I mean, it does, uh, there's lots of other things, but. I want to add to that. I mean, I hear a lot, of, a lot of young women say this. And one of the things that I hear is, how do we make people understand that they shouldn't talk like this? It's also partly what you're asking. And I really want to know why you care so much about other people's approval. Yeah. You know, yeah, they're going to slut shame you. People are going to say you shouldn't have dressed. You should not dress that way or something will happen to you. You should not, you should not, you should not. But if you want to do it, do it. And people aren't going to like it. And uh, your parents don't have to like everything you do. So this desire that everybody should approve of what you do, I personally, you have to take the risk. You have to take the risk of not being liked. You have to take the risk of not being agreed with. I'm not even saying the risk of violence. I'm saying that, you know, not doing things that everybody doesn't say are cool is one of the ways that the world changes. Yeah. So you give everybody a chance to understand. You explain to them why you do what you do. But eventually you do what you do, and maybe they won't catch up, and that's too bad, but that's just the way it is, you know? And have yeah. fun. Yeah. Have fun. And I want to just yeah, add a quick quote to this. This is something I really like, but I was, and I think it's really appropriate here. This is Audrey Lord, mm -hmm. who says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me mm -hmm. and eaten alive. Yeah, totally. This is great. Can I actually, I just want to read, um, I actually, my first book was on an Urdu poet. His name was M Mira. And I just want to read the first two verses of a poem he wrote in a, in, as a woman, literally, called uh, Raski Anoki Lehen, Rare Waves of Fashion. And it's as a woman talking. It was written in the 1940s in Urdu. I want the world's eyes to follow me, follow me as though I were a tree's supple branch as though eyes follow an arched, supple branch, but with its leaf load, like a dress, thrown off with the bedspread on the floor in a crumpled heap. I want gusts of wind to wrap themselves around me, pout, tease, laughingly say something, pause shyly, collect themselves with playful, passionate whis uh, whispers. I want to move on, walking sometimes, running like wind, skimming the ripples in a stream, rustling, flows on, doesn't pause, and I want to go to the end, actually. Very apropos. I'm sitting, my veil slips off my head. I'm lost in thought, someone will see my hair. This goes back to what you're saying. <laughs> the edges of joy's circle close in. Enough, let nothing new enter the circle of my joy. Hi, um, I'm Nidhi, I'm from Point of View. Um, thank you, everyone the panelists particularly, and the audience. I just wanted to bring another perspective here. We're talking about being virgin at 29, um, not you know, thinking about the hymen, accessing education. There are groups, we've spoken about marginalization and power, but there are groups of women who are considered asexual yeah. by women themselves. Right. It's almost assumed. So even if you have a quote unquote progressive gynecologist who you visit, who you visit um, one of my very a uh, senior colleague who's a disability rights activist as well, she says that I go to a very progressive gynecologist with a friend, and the friend's checked, and I'm not, because the assumption is that I will be asexual, I won't be sexually active, I'll be a virgin till the day I die. So I, we also, you know, when we talk about access, um, there are multiple layers of access that we are talking about. Um, not only accessing material around sex, so we spoke about pornography, so how does it work? for someone like me who's visually impaired to see pornographic images. When we're talking about sound, how does it work for someone who's hearing impaired? Um, but also, when we say access, where's the social access? Because a lot of, we conduct sexuality and disability programs, uh, trainings for people who are disabled. 
And they come back to me um, after, the, um, after the workshop and they say, yes, great, you know, we understand we are sexual beings, we have desires, you've, you've helped us acknowledge. But where is the society that treats us equally? Where is the access to people, to intimacy, to sex and desire? Thank you. Yes. It's not a comment, it's more of a question along with Gita when you were asked about discourse. Uh, obviously, no movement is going to be 100%. Everyone's agreeing on the same thing. But we're in a very sex-positive space right now. But there's obviously cases, as uh, this last woman just said, uh, where it can be exclusive to a lot of different people uh, who might, like, for example, with disability or like who might experience pain or through sex or uh, asexual people. Uh, and I guess I'm just asking, like, uh, well, at what point, uh, uh, how do we be inclusive in a sex-positive space? I think part of that is, like, our definition of sex. Uh, we tend to focus on penis and vagina, penetrative sex. Uh, and this education, I think, I, think, I would love your comments on it. Just uh, As sex-positive feminists, uh, how can we create a more inclusive space? Okay, I think we just do the last round of comments from each of us, and then we sort of sally forth to have vara, pov, etc. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody? Yeah. Well, I think I, I agree that you have to expand the meaning of sex itself, right? That this kind of penovaginal penetrative sex that is based on the idea of virginity and ownership, and not on the idea of pleasure, uh, that is one way to maximize the inclusiveness of how sex lives in the world and how we live with sex and how sex is in us. So I think that at least in a sex positive way, you don't mandate that there's one type of good sex. You kind of promote a sort of society of eroticism and different eroticisms. And for people to be able to find that eroticism in different forms and different uh, textures in their lives so that they can move forward towards making, defining their own sexual journeys. Um, I think, I mean, one of the things that was, uh, so that stopped me at some point. I was working with FGM activists in Ethiopia, and I just made the assumption that she didn't have sex because at the time I was young, I was trying to figure it out. I thought, I was queer, but I thought, okay, it is about the vagina. And she said, what makes you think my entire body is not an <laughs> erogenic zone, right? So she said, actually, I've learned to have sex with my entire body. I actually, you know, and I use all sorts of things to get pleasure. And it was a, you know, it was completely eye-opening. So I think, for me, that's a fantasy. I mean, literally, I, mean, I think when we, when we are with each other, one of the ways you can figure something out is by sharing fantasies, right? There's a whole lexicon of things, and I think, I'll say one last story, it was really interesting to me. I've, I was one of the first people to teach queer theory in the college where I was also an undergraduate. And um, what I started doing was actually integrating uh, theater into my classes. And one of the plays actually had um, Eve Sedgwick as a much, much, much older woman, woman having sex on stage. And after, you know, we did a workshop after the play with my students, and my students were really, really disturbed by the play. So I was trying to figure out where. What they couldn't cope with is a really much older woman with a sagging body and having sex on stage, right? And it's like they, they thought they were really radical, and we were really sex positive. We're in queer theory class. So sex positive doesn't, I mean, I agree, you know, I think it's important to understand what, where we stop thinking about it, because that, this is a, I think this is the last few comments. Yeah, and just my last thing, responding to what you were saying, I think for me as a sex positive feminist, it's really important that we dismantle norms around sex, right? Including the, you know, since, some, since you mentioned asexuality, I think including sort of sex positive, it doesn't mean that we are sort of saying like everybody has to have sex all the time, right. the same way, frequently, etc. Right. No. It's absolutely fine to position yourself wherever you want on the spectrum, right? But the question underlying that always is who's making the choice, right. who's making the decisions, and who has the power to influence those choices and decisions? Uh, 
I'm, I'm going to try and combine several of the comments into my final answer because these wonderful sex positive feminists have answered a lot of, of the issues that came up. I think one of the reasons that I continuously headbutt against the word virginity is that it does assume a penis and a vagina. Right. What does it mean if there are two penises involved? What does it mean if there are two vaginas or anal openings or a mouth or a whole body? Virginity, and this is why I keep insisting that it has to be dismantled, tells us how to have sex in a very particular way. One of the reasons that I could wait, and I speak only for myself, I think also when we talk about sex, it's very important for me to speak in the extremely personal, because I never want someone to step forward, and I get this all the time, don't speak for me, you don't speak for me, I don't speak for anyone except for myself. And I offer my very personal and for some embarrassing experience because we have to get over the embarrassment and the shame. One of the reasons that I was able to wait until I was 29 to have sex in that penis to vagina way was because I began masturbating when I was 11. How many times do we have these kind of conversations where we talk to children about our bodies and how we can experience our bodies and how I was able to give myself an orgasm at the age of 11 and it was a wonderful thing. So there's, there's this whole area of exploring our sexuality that doesn't involve penises and vaginas. And not everyone has to want sex, obviously. When I, when I talk, and, but this is very different than, than, than insisting that virginity is a good thing. I insist virginity is not a good thing because the concept in and of itself is used to shame women. And this ties into the woman who mentioned the golden temple. Women have, have internalized the messages of patriarchy and misogyny and will sit there and police each other. And so when I share with female friends, that I'm not monogamous, they, they treat me like a slut. And I don't need that, that judgment, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of my lifestyle. I have earned the right to say I'm polyamorous and this is how I lead my life. But women have internalized misogyny and patriarchy because they think that it will save them from the harms of patriarchy and nothing will. And so when I, when I talk to people about my vision of rights and how everyone in this room can enjoy sex in whatever way they want, I envision a room with a very high ceiling because the room that conservatives create is a room that is with a very low ceiling. And only men, men of their size fit in that room. The Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, who's a Christian zealot, the, the Muslim zealots, the Hindu zealots, the Sikh zealots, all, the Jewish zealots, all of these zealots are these tiny men who fit in these tiny rooms. And I don't fit in that room. The room that I want has such a high ceiling that we all fit into it in all our shapes and all our varieties without shame, without guilt, and saying, again, as I began, fuck the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs>